Fantastic. If you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21 this morning. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. We pick it up here in verse 10. It says, Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilences and there will be terrors and great signs from the heavens. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand on how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you will be put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we came this morning because we want to know you better. Lord, whether it's to have an encounter with you that we've never had before, or whether it is to become deeper and more committed disciples, Lord, we come because we want to grow in our walk with you. Lord, I pray that the teaching and the examination of your word would help that very truth happen today. We pray this in your name. Amen. Before we dive into this text, and we're, we're taking a look at all the ways in which Jesus gives us victory, and this morning we're talking about the fact that Jesus gives us victory over opposition. Before we dive into the passage that we just looked at, I want us to just kind of take a moment, back up just for a hair, and just see the context of the passage that we're talking about. It's the final week of Jesus' ministry. It is the final days of Jesus' ministry. He is there in Jerusalem. The tensions are very, very hot. It is a, 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 a spark is about to go off as we will see in this uh, coming week. But in this day, he is spending the day with the disciples in the temple, and they are observing the things that are going on in the temple. One of the things that's interesting, though, is that Jesus and his disciples are impressed with two completely different things. And in fact, Jesus and his disciples are unimpressed by completely opposite things. If you take a look, glance on the page there at the beginning of chapter 21, what you have is a woman who walks by. She is identified as a widow, which tells us something uh, about her, but significantly it tells us that she is probably a person who's barely holding it together financially. She comes by and drops an offering in the offering box, the collection box there. Now these guys have been watching all the financial big hitters walk by, dropping money in there and say, ooh, did you see that? Ooh, did you hear that? I must have been a lot. You know, particularly in this time when everything was a coin that would rattle. Oh, man, and if you got to your wrist action just right, you, you know, you could really make that offering, make, make some noise. And this woman quietly goes by and just drops these two coins that, that almost float. They are so light and so invaluable. And I'm sure that the disciples looked at her and said, whatever, wait for one of the big hitters to come by. And Jesus says, now that lady gave more than anybody else because she gave all that she had. The disciples were completely unimpressed. But Jesus says, that's the story for today. That's the person to pay attention to. I don't know exactly how the conversation stirred. It could be sometimes when we're corrected or, or, or we kind of are made to look a little bit silly. We, we try to change the subject. Not that that's ever happened to me, but may, maybe it's happened to you. you. You try to change the subject a little bit. And the disciples sitting there in the temple, uh, and, and, and listen, we love this church and we love this building, but it's nothing compared to that temple that they worshiped in in that day. And the disciples said, man, Jesus, have you checked out this temple? I mean, have you seen this temple? Look at the Man, this is really, really impressive, isn't it? And Jesus said, eh, not really. First of all, 
Jesus knows a little something about heaven. He's not impressed with a stack of stones. But secondly, he says to them, the time is coming when this building is going to be torn down to the ground. There's a time coming when everything that you see here and that you celebrate here and that you think is so great is going to be a pile of rubble. Now the disciples have been impressed by the building, Jesus not so much. But when Jesus tells those disciples, this place that you're so impressed with is going to be a pile of rubble, they, their brains almost explode. And what? 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 What are you talking All of this is going to be gone? It just fathom, it's unfathomable to them. And the question is, when? When is this going to happen? Now, Jesus answers that question in a couple of different ways. The basic answer to that question is later. It's not now. It's later. And there's probably some ways in which Jesus is talking about a couple of things, which there's going to be a little bit later now, and then even later down the road. And he tells them some things. He says, listen, I'm going to tell you when it's going to happen. And then he describes things that happen all of the time. He says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Well, that's about every o'clock. I mean, that happens all of the time. There's going to be famines in some places. There's going to be earthquakes in some places. There's going to be disease in some places. And Jesus says, that's when all this stuff is going to happen. Well, thanks, but that happens almost all of the time. Now understand that Jesus is giving us a glimpse, but at the same time, he also says, I'm going to tell you what time it is. It's not anyone else's place to know exactly when these things are going to happen. So just know that it's coming, but it's not for you to know the time, the place, or the hour. Now, the part that I want to pay attention to this morning is, he says, but before all of these things happen. In other words... There's the end, and there's the before the end. And while we don't necessarily know when the end is going to happen, he says, listen, but before any of that stuff happens, let me tell you about some things that are going to happen. And he's telling the disciples, this is some stuff that you're going to deal with. And I believe that he's telling every generation since, here are some things that you are going to have to deal with as you are a follower of Christ. The first thing that he tells them is that friction is going to be inevitable. Friction is going to be inevitable. Maybe I, I kind of tamped that phrase down to friction, but what he says here is he says, listen, they will come and put their hands on you, and they will turn you over to the synagogues and to the courts and before the kings and before every kind of power. He says, because you are a follower of me, they are going to turn you over to the courts. They are going to bring you before the places of power and authority, and they are going to bring you in and throw you before them and say, punish these folks for how they live and for who they are. Now, who is the they? I believe that the they is the people around us. Jesus tells us that the people around us are going to bring us before the courts and before powers and make accusations against us and seek that we be punished because we are followers of Jesus. In fact, at the end of this passage, not only does he say they as in the people around us, but even more discomforting is the fact that he says your family and your relatives, and your friends, and those people who are closest to you are going to turn you over. Now, I want to walk carefully in this place because they're coming to a season in our lives right now where this is beginning to resonate a little bit inside of us. And we're beginning to be concerned and we're beginning to be worried about this. 
But I want you to know that there is something that is normal about this kind of friction and opposition to the people of Christ. I want you to know that if we head into a season where there is increased friction about what it means to be a follower of Christ, that's not things getting weird, that's things returning to normal. Jesus said to those first disciples, and if you study church history, from that point forward, to be a follower of Christ has meant opposition and friction. Now, I, I want to just spend a moment here because I, I don't want us to get this idea that there is this grand conspiracy against Christians. I don't want you to get this idea that as we move into 2016 and 2017 and 2020 and, and down the road, that, that I don't want us to live as though we are afraid of this giant boogeyman and this idea that there is a conspiracy that people are out to get us because we're Christians. How? I think it's simpler than that. I think people don't get us. I think people don't understand what it is that we believe and why we live the way that we do. You see, you have to understand that you and I live different. You and I believe different. We believe that there is a creator of the universe who put all things into place. We believe that there's a creator of the universe who has prescribed boundaries and parameters for how we are to live. We believe that there is such a thing as sin that causes separation between us and God and damages our life and breaks our spiritual content with Him. We believe that there is a Savior who comes, who takes away all of those sins. We believe that forgiveness becomes the foundational point of how we are to live before God and how we are to live before others. We believe that Jesus said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. We believe that Jesus says, come and you submit yourself to one another. Jesus comes and says that when we live for eternity, that matters more than what happens here. That's what we believe. And there are other people who don't have that same experience, belief system, that when they look at a person who says, well, I can't do that because that's outside of what God wants, and he has authority for my life, and I have to line up my life according to his word. And when we talk about living in submission to one another, all of those things are extremely puzzling and disconcerting and foreign to the people who do not believe those things. And that difference, that difference of what is the core of what we believe, causes tension and causes friction. It causes tension at your place of work because you're going to work with a different ethic than some of your co-workers that don't have the same faith that you have. It's going to cause tension at your school because you don't see dating the same way that they see dating. It's going to cause tension in your relationship with your friends because you're going to speak differently, live differently, recreate differently than they do. And the differences that make up who you are in your faith and the differences that they don't experience and they don't share is going to have this friction and this tension. It's not that they decide we hate Christians. It's that they don't get it. They haven't experienced it. And the very thing that are the core convictions of our life are so different than what their natural core convictions are in their life. You see, Jesus tells us that to be a follower of him, friction is inevitable. Now, a quick little footnote on this. Mike and I were talking about this during the week, and, and Mike just kind of said, you know, that, that makes you think that if you're living your life as a believer in Christ, and there's no friction in your life, there, there's no friction with any of the people around you, then it could be that we're living too much like a person who doesn't have those convictions inside of our life. 
that, that our lives are not being defined by the uniqueness of Christ and the power of God and the authority of our Savior. And so therefore, we're just kind of blending in. And so there's just a little bit of a diagnostic moment in this passage that says, listen, not only is friction inevitable, but man, friction is supposed to be present in our life. And if you're not facing some friction, some place, I don't mean to go be a difficult pain in the neck person. You don't get bonus points for being a pain in the neck. That's not a spiritual gift. Although some of you, no, uh, it's, it's not a spiritual gift. But if there is not a natural division at times because your life is centered on Jesus Christ and much of the world isn't, that's going to cause friction and division and opposition in that place. The second thing he tells us in this passage is that he tells us that opposition is opportunity. He tells us that opposition is opportunity. Now, I got to tell you, if I were writing Luke chapter 21, I would write it a little bit differently. I think that if you were writing Luke chapter 21, you would write it a little bit differently. Let's back it up uh, here. It says in verse 12, it says that before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. Now at this point in time, I want God to say, but I'm going to knock them down. And, I, and I'm going to fix that. And I'm going to release you. And I'm going to protect you so that you never have to face those kinds of trials. And you never have to face those persecutions. And I will protect you in all of those places so that you do not have to face those things. I mean, that's the way I would write Luke chapter 21. But instead he says... They will persecute you and deliver you up to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for mine sakes. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. He says this is a gold star moment. This isn't a crisis point. This is opportunity. This is a gift that's been given to you. Man, can't you wait to open up that gift? But I think that you would agree with me if I were to say that one of the greatest needs in the church today is for our message to be heard, one of the greatest things that's needed for the church in the year 2016 is for lost people and for unbelievers to even hear our message. Jesus tells us that this persecution and these trials and this friction and opposition is the platform for our message to be heard. You see, what happens when we are arrested, what happens when, when we are scoffed at, what happens when we are mocked, is we are introduced in our message and our belief and our lives are put on display. We want the trials, so that we have opportunity to explain what we believe and so that people can see the difference that it makes in our life. You see, what this world needs is they need to see people who believe in Jesus Christ and they need to see those people and hear those people and they need to observe the kindness that's found in those people, the confidence that's found in those people, the security that's found in those people, and the peace that's found in those people, and the joy that's found in those people. And persecution and opposition will put us on a platform where the entire world or your neighbor or your kids or your family member will see the power of Jesus in ways that, that Jesus has not seen in any other way. Again, looking back over the course of church history, the strongest days, the most powerful message of the church has always been in the times when persecution and hardship and opposition has been at its strongest because that's when the people of God stand up and they stand so unique against the culture and people envy 
the people who are being persecuted. I wish I could have that kind of character. I wish I had that kind of confidence. I wish I had that kind of peace. I wish I had that kind of security. And so while they are trying to make us suffer, all of a sudden by the way in which we respond, they envy us and they want to be like us. Persecution gives us that kind of platform and that kind of opportunity. So don't run away from those moments. And one of the things that's interesting in this passage is that Jesus says, let me just tell you one more thing. Now this is strange. This is a surprise. Jesus says, let me tell you one more thing. Don't plan ahead of time what you're going to say in those moments. Don't you like to plan ahead of time what you're going to say in those moments? You ever, you ever get in kind of a conflict with somebody and say, the next time I see that person, boy, I know just what I'm going to say? And you stand in front of the mirror and you rehearse the script that you've been working on. This and then this and then you did this and then and you've got that whole... Okay, nobody's ever done that. Okay, that's fine. It's just, you know, something I've seen my kids do. I, you know, I don't know. Hey, I think it happens. You get the script and say, if I ever get the chance, I'm going to do all this. We, we like to prepare. And we like to know those things. And, we th and what happens in those moments is we think that I have invented the perfect script and there will be no answer to what I have to say. Now, there's a handful of times you've gotten to deliver that script. How'd it go? The script never works. For like 10 seconds, it makes you feel better. and it, it never works. The script doesn't work. And spiritually, sometimes, when we prepare for opposition, when we've got all of our study notes, and we've got all the things that we've read on, we've listened to on some radio program or on some website, and we've got these packaged answers. Jesus says, don't use packaged answers. One of the reasons is that packaged answers don't move anybody. They convince the already convinced. But pre-packaged answers don't change lives. They don't change your life. When you, when you get a mailing from a politician and they say, you should vote for me, and they, they pre-package this list, I bet you almost none of you have ever changed your vote based on a pre-packaged list of, of, of characteristics. Don't pre-packaged. He says, but instead, I will give you the mouth, and I will give you the wisdom. Man, is that good? And he says, when I give you the mouth and I give you the wisdom, when I give that to you, no one will be able to stand against it. You see, the Holy Spirit knows exactly what needs to be said. The Holy Spirit knows exactly what that person needs to hear in that moment, not our prepackaged stuff. Now, that doesn't mean you don't study the Word of God. That doesn't mean you don't think through issues. But when you come into those places of opposition, and when you come into those places of friction, you listen to the Spirit of God who will speak into your life. Jesus also tells us that preservation is promised. He tells us that preservation is promised. You know, sometimes we can get anxious in the middle of things. Anybody ever get anxious in the middle of things? I have to tell you that one of the places in recent days of my life that I have been most anxious were some seasons in my doctoral work. And there would be times when I'd be sitting here at church in the evenings or on the weekends, and, and I'd have to call Susan or text Susan and, and just tell her, baby, I, I don't know that this is happening. I don't know that I'm going to be able to finish. I am overwhelmed. I don't think I'm going to be able to make this. To which my lovely, gracious wife said, Honey, understand, you are finishing this. And it, you know, it sounds like it might have been a word of encouragement, but I, I think I was supposed to hear this as a threat. But in that moment, we do get overwhelmed. And she knew that I was struggling in the moment. But the reality was she knew that I would get it done. But boy, we feel that moment sometimes, don't we? 
You, you've been in a, in, in a moment where it just feels like the walls are crushing in on you. We're not going to make it. And maybe you feel some of this friction, some of this opposition, some of, maybe even some, some tough stuff in your own house, in your own family, extended family, and you feel some of that and say, I don't know that I'm going to make it. I want you to know that Jesus promises us that we will persevere. Now, remember I told you that one of the reasons why there's friction is people don't understand what we believe because what we believe is different. You remember I said that? I hope so. It was only like 11 minutes ago. So I, I hope that you remember that I, that, that I said that. But, but this is one of those places. Listen to what he says here. He says your family is going to uh, turn you over. In fact, let, let's pick it up here. Uh, it says in verse 16, it says, You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. Now, here we go. You ready? You're going to be delivered up by, by your family. And then it says, And some of you will be put to death. And it says, And all of you will be hated for my name's sake. That doesn't sound like persevering, does it? But listen to the next sentence. Listen to this next sentence. This is amazing. It, it, it threw me out of my chair this week. You will be, some of you will be put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair on your head will perish. Oh, you might struggle. You might face some difficulty. You might even die, but you won't perish. Because that's just this life. That's just this moment. And he says, I will protect you for all of eternity. So no matter the hardest thing, the most difficult thing that you face in this life, he says, you might even die, but you won't perish. Not even a hair on your head will perish. Oh, that's amazing to me. That is the bigger picture that we live in, that, that we experience, that makes us think differently than other people because I might die, but I won't perish. Our preservation is promised. Now, how are we supposed to respond to this? Let me just suggest to you how you can live this out in this week. is that your voice needs to be heard. Your friends, your neighbors, your kids' friends that come and hang out at your house, they need to hear someone that knows God, loves God, stands for God, follows God. They need to hear that, see that. Somebody needs to speak that into this world. You are the missionary. You are the assigned person to speak that into their life. So this week, your voice as a follower of Christ needs to be heard. Now, you are unlikely to be thrown in jail this week because you speak the name of Jesus or because you make a Jesus choice. But you know what? It's also quite likely that someone's going to roll their eyes at you and somebody's just going to hold back a laugh or someone might even withdraw some friendship or some relationship. Now, I don't want us to come to the place where we say, I'll go to, I'll go to jail for Jesus. But man, if someone's going to roll their eyes at me, I, I can't do that. And someplace this week, your voice needs to be heard. I also would say to you that, that, that when your voice is heard, would you make sure that what they hear is the kindness of Christ? Would you make sure that what they hear is the peace that you have in Christ? The joy that you have in Christ, the security that you found in Him? Would you make sure that what it is that they hear when your voice speaks is not belligerence or difficulty or pain in the neckness, but that they would hear that peace and joy and security, and the kindness that Jesus Christ is redoing in our lives, would you make sure that's what it is that they hear, even in the face of friction and opposition? And then this week, and then this week, 
would you listen? Because the Spirit of God wants to put some words into your mouth. Man, that's an unbelievable statement. The Spirit of God wants to put some words into your mouth mouth and the problem is some of the time we won't shut up long enough for him to do it would you listen in an unexpected place where you have no idea that God wants to speak into your life that the spirit of God is going to whisper something into your ear and say I want you to say this you're like really now to this yes now to this person say these words because the Spirit of God is better than any checklist or script that you've ever heard or found out. And he knows exactly what that person needs to hear. And he put you in the middle of their path so that he can give you a word to speak it. So would you listen this week? Because the Spirit of God. One of my favorite sentences this week. The Spirit of God wants to put words into your mouth. Is that amazing? Listen, that's how God gives us victory over opposition. It doesn't last. It doesn't matter. But more than anything, it is an opportunity for the voice of God to be heard more clearly than it does without it. And he wants to put words in your mouth this week. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I ask for your pulling us and drawing us this morning. Lord, I don't want us to live paranoid or fearful or even worried about our rights. But instead, I want us to see some of this friction and this opposition as a normal part of being a follower of Christ and as an opportunity for you to be heard by people who need to hear about you. Lord, help us to know that we are secure in you. Even when we face the hardest and most difficult things in life, not a hair on our head will perish. I thank you for this in your name. Amen. This morning I want to invite you that if you don't know Jesus in the way in which we've been talking about, you're on the outside of faith looking in and you need to know Jesus, we want to invite you this morning because we'd love to pray for you and help you to experience Jesus from the inside out instead of just the outside in. If you're feeling like you're facing some friction, some opposition, some persecution this morning and you want someone to pray for you, then we want to pray for you. If you want to just come and kneel down front here and just tell the Spirit of God, would you put some words in my mouth this week? I'm going to be listening. Whatever it is, would you respond? Jennifer will be down front. Mike's down front. I'll be here as well. Church, would you respond? Stand.